confirms within us um, that which we believe to be true. And we thank you that um, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and then children and heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with them so that we may be also glorified together with them. And so, and so even though we may be in this present life um, experiencing some, some of the suffering, there's going to be glory one day. And so we, we praise you for, for that hope. And so we have this rest, we have this reassurance, we have this peace. So if there be any in this room that don't have that peace, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit, even though your law convicts of sin, that um, by the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, your kindness leads us to repentance. So lead us into a place of repentance and of restoration and of your joy. Let's pray these things with hope. And in Jesus' name. Well, this morning, let's uh, take out our Bibles and let's meander over to Isaiah chapter 17. We're going to continue our study through the prophecy of Isaiah. And as you're landing there, let me remind you that uh, the first section of Isaiah is chapters 1 through 12, and those chapters deal primarily with prophecies concerning Judah and Jerusalem, the southern portion of the kingdom of Israel. And what is happening in those chapters is God, through the pen of Isaiah, is prophesying that if they don't turn, they're essentially going to burn. And while he's warning them, what he also does is he, in the middle of this prophecy of impending destruction and doom uh, because of their disobedience, he weaves into it this beautiful prophecy that from them, because of his faithfulness, is going to come the Messiah. And that their disobedience and their mistakes are not final. And that the Lord God that birthed them as a nation is going to provide through them a king that will reign forever. Now, that said, we transition in chapters 13 through 27 to these chapters that have prophecies dealing primarily with the nations of the world, any nation that is not Israel. And in chapters 13 and 14, we dealt with Babylon. And in chapters 15 and 16, we dealt with Moab. And yet today in chapter 17, we have this odd marriage in this prophecy as the Lord deals with Israel and then the nation of Syria. And the reason that that happens is because these two nations were confederated uh, with one another against Assyria and against uh, their little brother, Israel's little brother to the south, Judah. And so pick up with me in chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, uh, as we begin here in this burden against Damascus, the city of Damascus, the capital city of the nation of Syria. And behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. And the cities of Arar are forsaken. They will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them afraid. There won't be any people to make the flocks afraid. They'll be living out in the wilderness by themselves where Damascus used to be, is the prophecy. The fortress also will cease from Ephraim, the kingdom of from Damascus and the remnant of Syria, they will be as the glory of the children of Israel or the departed glory is the idea, says the Lord. Now, before we begin, let's uh, give you a little history lesson. I know you love that a little geography lesson. I know you love that, too. So uh, here's the setup. God is prophesying that Syria and Israel or Samaria will no longer exist as they were at the time of this writing. So here's how it shakes out. In the nation of Israel, many years before, the nation had split and divided into two kingdoms. And so the northern kingdom of Israel consisted of ten tribes, and 
that northern kingdom had as its capital city Samaria. Now, uh, Samaria by Jesus' day was a region of half-Jews, but in the day of Isaiah's writing, Samaria was the capital of the ten northern tribes, and so sometimes the Bible refers to those ten northern tribes of Israel as Samaria. Now, if that's not confusing enough, Ephraim is the biggest, the chief tribe in the northern Israel, uh, Israel community, the kingdom. And so sometimes the Lord calls the ten northern tribes in prophecy Israel. Sometimes he calls them uh, Samaria, and sometimes he calls it Ephraim. Isn't that easy? Now, uh, in the southern kingdom, you have Judah. That's the chief tribe of the two tribes uh, in the northern, in the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom, its capital is Jerusalem. So, again, Judah and Jerusalem dealt with in chapters 1 through 12 primarily. Then when you start thinking about this confederation of Syria and Israel, you're dealing with Israel or Samaria as its capital. And it confederated with its longtime enemy, Syria, which, by the way, if you read in the Old Testament, is also ancient Aram. So it could be referred to as the Aramites. That's not confusing, right? So Syria, Aram, capital city, Damascus. And these two nations that had been primarily at war, traditionally at war with one another, confederated together against the rising world empire, Assyria. And since they were strong, they decided to uh, pick on their brother to the south, Judah. They thought, now we're stronger, we, we'll exercise our power. What this led to was what's known as the Syro-Ephraimite War. So Syro, Syro for uh, Syria, and then Ephraimite uh, for Ephraim, Israel. And this coalition or this confederation, they basically thumbed their nose at the world power of Syria. Now remember, God's tool of judgment for that time for Israel and for the nations was Assyria. So when this confederation thumbed their nose at Assyria, it did not go well for them. And so uh, about the time of this writing, the Syro-Ephraimite War was happening, 734 uh, BC or so. And because uh, they thumbed their nose at Assyria, Assyria came down hard on them. They wiped out Syria and then they would roll in in 722 B.C., and they would wipe out uh, the northern kingdom, okay? And so that's what we have here. This alliance is prophesied against because in their strength, they had joined together against what the Lord was doing, essentially. Now, when we think about the impending judgment on Syria and Israel... Remember, Isaiah, he's a little bit of a crafty veteran. He's not afraid to switch gears on us. So as you kind of got that all as the backdrop, then in verse 4, we have a transition because we see the phrase, in that day. And in that day, as we've told you, that phrase refers to the last days or the last of the last days. And the last days prophetically start with the first coming of Jesus, culminates in the second coming of Jesus physically, and so this is speaking of that last of the last days when Jesus comes again and makes things right. And before Jesus comes again, there'll be this great tribulation on the earth. And it's specifically called in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, this time of Jacob's trouble, which uh, is this. God judges the nations in this great tribulation, but he's also dealing specifically with his chosen people, Jacob or Israel or Ephraim, as you want to call it. And so uh, keep this in mind as we head through this chapter, the what will happen shortly after Isaiah's day to Israel and Syria is a prelude to what eventually will take place on a worldwide scale in the Great Tribulation. It'll be the, the time of Jacob's trouble as God sifts the nations. And so in that day, verse 4 says, it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob or Israel will wane. And the fatness of his flesh will grow lean, and it shall be as when the harvester gathers grain. And so in this sense, immediately Assyria was going to be the harvester. But we told you back in the 10th chapter that Assyria is also a picture of the, the Antichrist that opposes the Jews and opposes the Lord. And so in, 
It will be in that day when the harvester gathers the grain and he reaps the heads of, uh, with his arm that it shall be as he who gathers heads of grain in the valley of Rephaim. And that was a, a valley of giants initially. And so the imagery here is, in the poetry is it'll be like if you followed giants after they had uh, gathered all the grain out of their fields, what would be left over is very little is the idea. And yet gleaning grapes, verse 6, will be left in it, the field, like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives at the top of the uppermost ball, four or five in the most fruitful branches, says the Lord God of Israel. And so when God judges these nations, it's going to be like after they would pick an olive tree clean. If you followed up, you'd be like, well, I'd like to get some olives for my family. You'd shake the tree. There's like five or six left at the very top which nobody bothered with, there's not going to be enough to feed anybody. That's, that's the idea. And in that day, verse 7, a man will look to his maker, and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. So the shaking is meant to produce this return or this look to the maker. And we've mentioned before in Zechariah, it says that after that great tribulation, the Jews are going to look upon Jesus, who they rejected at his first coming, and they're going to say, hey, where did you get those wounds in your hands? And he's going to say, I got them in the house of my friends. Their eyes are going to be open. They're going to see their maker, their Messiah for who he is. And in that day, verse 8, he will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. He will not Respect what his fingers have made, nor the wooden images, nor the incense altars, because he's going to see the maker is the one who sustained him and created is the idea. He's not going to look to his own strength. And verse 9 says, in that day, his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow would be our uppermost branch. And the idea is, I kind of feel like when you see the imagery here, it's, it's kind of undergrowth. You ever seen where the MDC will burn out something like a, a conservation area or a state park, and then they let it grow back up. And it's some of the thickest, wildest growth. Like you can't hardly get through there in a thicket. That's what it's going to look like. Uh, and it's going to be like when Israel had left the land and there was desolation. When Israel came into the land uh, and the people fled, it was all overgrown. The Israelites just came right in and inhabited it, but they had to clean up some of the, the wild areas. But then when Israel flees, it's going to be the same way. When there's judgment, there's going to be all this uh, disunity and disharmony ecologically. And it's because, verse 10, you have forgotten the God of your salvation, not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold, and therefore you will plant pleasant plants, and you'll set out foreign seedlings, and uh, in that day you'll grow your plant, um, and in the morning you'll make your seed flourish, but the harvest will be a heap of ruins, and in that day uh, of grief and desperate sorrow, that's when it will all happen. Now, interestingly enough, before we go on, thinking about the end times and us living in the times you know, that are very much towards the end, when you think about Israel setting out foreign seedlings in verse 10 and uh, making your plant grow and everything flourish, uh, just a little over a generation ago, Israel didn't even exist as a nation. But one of the things that's always struck me as we go and visit Israel, they point out when you're riding around and you're looking at all these forests and all the trees, that uh, those trees did not exist 70 years ago. In the last 70 years, Israel has planted 240 million trees. They basically repopulated a place that had been devastated by armies. Every time the army would come in, they would deforest a place to, to take its natural resources. And yet, when the tribulation happens, it seems that one of the things that will be impacted heavily is uh, the trees and the plants. Israel's right now the breadbasket of the Middle East. It provides uh, much of the fruit and the produce for all the Middle East, and so that'll be heavily impacted. Now, verse 12, woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas, and to the rushing nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters, 
The nations will rush like the rushing of many waters, but God will rebuke them because they're rushing against him is the idea. And they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Now, I know that it was a lot, but uh, what I want to do is, is point out something here. What Isaiah is using is the imagery of harvest. And what Isaiah is saying is that these people, because of their disobedience to God and because of their great iniquity and their trust in their own strength, they have uh, planted and they will then reap a harvest of sorrow. That's the idea. Now, in reading this, there was a commentary I read that said uh, this, to every life, there is a harvest either of joy or sorrow. And uh, he went on to say, the harvest of sorrow may, in every case, be traced to one great cause, and that's found in verse 10 of our text, uh, the forgetting of the God of your salvation. They are going to reap a harvest of sorrow because they have forgotten the God of their salvation. Now, your mind may object to that statement that the harvest of sorrow may in every case be traced to one great cause, this forgetting the God of your salvation, because your mind may say, well, I have sorrow that, that has nothing to do with me forgetting God. I mean, I, I believe there's a God. I haven't forgotten God, but I had this thing taken away from me. Or my health failed here, or I lost this job, or this person, you know, and we could go on down the list. But the reality is that the harvest of sorrow is interesting in a sense that uh, when it pertains to the forgetting of the God of your salvation, you can uh, believe in God mentally, but uh, live practically like an atheist. And so when it comes to trials, not every trial that we have comes because we have disobeyed or forgotten God as maybe the atheist would, walking away and saying there is no God. Uh, Jesus said in this world you're going to have what? Tribulation, trial, troubles. You're going to have sorrow because sin has impacted the whole world. But he said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And he wasn't just speaking eternally, which is a very big positive for us. He was also speaking about right now. In the sense that James would say, when you fall into various trials and tribulations, and that word various is like whether you cause them or not, you know, whether you have uh, the reaping of your own actions or the, the reaping of someone else's actions, uh, James says this, when you fall into various trials, count it all joy. Now raise your hand if that's you. Every trial, all joy. And, and by the way, here's the difficult thing about trials. It's one thing if I actually did wrong and then I'm reaping what I have sown. But I don't know about you. It seems to be even harder if I am going through various trials and tribulations that are either A, unexplainable, like they just there's no rhyme or reason. And the more that we uh, learn and the more knowledgeable that we get, it's so much harder for people if you can't Google it and figure it out, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to deal with it. Like the WebMDs, they, we're all doctors now. But what if, you know, what if you can't Google it and find out the thing on the WebMDs? Or what, what if you can't? And so there's the what ifs. But then uh, think about it like on a macro level. Uh, I think Christians in America, many people as Christians would be upset at kind of what they see as the way that America is going, and they'd be upset with some, you know, form or part of the government. And they're, they're so upset about what is or could be happening to them that they can't count it on joy, all joy because they see, no, I didn't have a part in this. I'm not a part of this thing or that thing. And so I'm upset at that thing. Um, now, truth is this, uh, Probably as Christians, we're a lot more culpable for the state of this country than, than we believe. We're the only ones with the salt and the light. So if there isn't a ton of salt and light, we're not the, you know, we're, we're not the ones that can, can really blame 
dark on the darkness. Uh, that's all they can do. But that said, then, on a macro level, that's one thing. But then take it down to your family. Like, you suffer sometimes. I mean, if you, my wife, if you would pull her up here, she's shy. But if you pull her up here and say, like, what has the majority of your suffering been over the last 23 years? Honestly, she'd say, Mike Harrison. <laughs> it's not that much of a joke. You know, my kids, like, they're going to be dealing with, like, having me as a dad. Maybe a few positives in there, but quite a bit of, like, messed up stuff their whole life. You know, you're walking through life because of, uh, you know, you didn't choose to be in the family you were in. You're dealing with stuff right now. And you were like, hey, I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't ask to be put in that family and have to deal with that stuff the rest of my... So, and then what happens is what we, we know there's a God, but what we don't do is like James. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations, whether you caused them or whether you kind of inherited them or whether there's no reason for them. Because in doing so, when you endure... You let patience have its perfect work. And what patience does is it produces a thing which God wants most in us, and that's maturity. So, so here's the thing. We choose whether we are going to forget God or not forget God. Now, on one end of the spectrum, I don't know which end would be left or right, there is uh, Metallica. Okay, I grew up listening to Metallica, oddly enough. In Ellington, you'd think that we would be Hank Williams Jr. people, but we were Metallica people. And so when I read this about Harvest, the first words that come to my mind come from a Metallica song from the 80s, Harvester of Sorrow. And, uh, and, I, and I realized that somehow, before Christ, I can repeat almost every line from Harvester of Sorrow, and I've not thought about it for 25 years. So I double-checked my, uh, my lyrics in my head because sometimes they're wrong. I make up lyrics when I can't figure them out. And I realized that in Harvester of Sorrow, uh, let me read you the first line and then uh, the chorus. And remember, it's Metallica. They were probably drinking tons of vodka when they wrote this. And, and, and this is, this is the, the opening line to Harvester of Sorrow. My life suffocates planting seeds of hate. I've loved, turned to hate, trapped far beyond my fate. And then this line always stuck out to me. Anger, misery, you suffer unto me. And then here's the chorus, very touching. Harvester of sorrow. And then in the back, these figures like cry out in unison, language of the mad. And I thought to myself, you know what? Metallica was, was speaking prophetically in the sense that they were just speaking about what they were reaping. They were living it. They, they were speaking authentically about what they were reaping from, from not just saying that, you know, it wasn't that they said there is no God. If they do mention God in their music, it's usually mocking or questioning. But, but that's one side where you go, yeah, I, I see that's what the world's going to get when Jesus comes back. They're going to they're gonna reap it. The harvester of sorrow is going to to reap what the world has sown, essentially. But, but past that, then, when I think about the Christian, I think about myself, forgetting God looks a lot of, like in the middle of what I'm going through, not acknowledging that God is he, is, he is the author and finisher of salvation. He is, um, at the very, you might say, least, he is the uh, one who allows all things in my life. And it might say at the very most, he's the cause of everything. So when I look at the, the things that are unexplainable, sorrowful, I, I have to say to myself, either God uh, has allowed these things for good because God is good, or I've got I've to forget what the Bible says about him and make up my own reality and trust upon the things of the flesh that my senses can engage in. Are you tracking with me? And so as Christians, we can say, oh, yeah, I know God. The Israelites knew God. They still worship God. But they mixed all this other stuff in that it felt right. It engaged their senses. And so what happens is they willfully traded in the true and living God and the joy in the midst of the trial, which the joy of the Lord is the only salvation we have in the midst of trial. And that is supernatural. And they have this uh, in, in the desert. 
out the salt flats I've read of, you know, you, you can see as far on clear days like as the curvature of the earth will allow. And there's this vanishing point for where they run the races out on the salt flats. And apparently you can go out to a vanishing point with a guy with a stake and you can stick it in the ground and you can say, yeah, I can see. And he can take one step back, gone, vanished because of the curvature of the earth. And for all of us, no matter how much we know, there's a vanishing point to what we can understand. And then it's by faith that we choose whether we're going to uh, remember God and remember what the Bible says about God, that God says, I am good, I am true, I am love. If you want to read the three epistles of John, that's what you get. God is love, God is true, God is good. That's who God is. And so we choose whether we're going to embrace our situation with God at the forefront of our minds or we're going to reject him willfully. And Romans says this, that we all suppress the truth when we do willfully. God's manifested himself so that we know him and can see him on our worst day. We willfully choose. And when you think about the nations turning on him in verses 12 and 13, then look with me back to uh, Psalm chapter 2. I don't have it there for you. But it says this, Psalm chapter 2, verse 1, Why did the nations rage and why did the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their, their look, bonds in peace. They rage against the Lord and against his anointed, and they say, Let us break their, capital T, that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords away from us. So, so the reality is this. When you think about uh, rebellion against God and forgetting God, the truth is no one makes you do that. I mean, the devil's running his playbook. And in second chapter of First John says this, that the, this is the devil's playbook. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And, and he runs it. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil that run the devil's playbook. And so he's not all that tricky. He tells you what he's going to do. The Bible tells you he's going he's to run the lust of the flesh left. He's going to run the lust of the eyes uh, right. And then right up the middle, he's going to run the prod of life. He's going to stop me if you can. And the only way that you can stop him is by acknowledging and, and saying, I remember the Lord is in this place. And Dave and I were just talking, Dave Williams, I went up to the youth room. I like to pop in there between services and see all the youth gather and watch them warm up and do worship. And Dave said, hey, you know what our, uh, you know what our message is on today? They're, kinda, they're cruising through the Bible at 30,000 feet up there. And so they're doing like one book a week for this, this year, kind of covering it all, giving kids like a general idea and emphasizing the main point. He says, you know what we're, our message is today? Got no clue, Dave. He said, forgetting God. <laughs> he said, you ever think about that? That's, that's, that's the, how do you not forget God? You see, that's no coincidence. Like you start realizing how God daisy chains all these little events together. I can't tell you how many times that happens. I would listen to the worship set. I never tell Jared where I'm going to be at. And I throw him so many curveballs at the way that I go and pace I go. The worship leader never knows. And almost every time just by prayer and the Holy Spirit He's singing, we're singing the same words that we're studying on a Sunday morning. That's God. That's remembering God in the middle of every situation. And so in the harvest of sorrow, it's very interesting because uh, we are traditionally, we are historically a people that soon forget God. And when you think about the people in Israel, in Exodus, before they ever got to the promised land, they get delivered from Egypt and God writes through Moses, they have turned aside quickly out of the way I commanded them. They just got across the Red Sea. They haven't even made it to the promised land and they've already forgotten God. Later in Psalm 106, you have this kind of history of Israel to date. And God says they forgot their Savior who had done all these great things. And when you get to Galatians, Paul's writing to a Christian church and he says, I marvel that you've turned away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ. And, and you've really you've embraced a different gospel. Because reality is anything we add to the pure gospel of Christ 
is, is a different gospel. It's a different God. And so we forget the God of our salvation we're prone to. Now, all that said, when we do, God eventually allows a harvest of sorrow, and it's not all for the bad. Because if we'll respond to the sorrow, what sorrow does do is it usually wakes us up to our own mortality, our finiteness. And then what happens is the harvest of sorrow in part allows those who will respond appropriately to look to, verse 7 says, or remember their maker. And that's something that in the middle of the great tribulation, it seems there's going to be a ton of people who are going to experience sorrow and they're going to reap judgment because they're going to be too hard-hearted. They're going to shake their fist at God, and they're going to be angry at Him, or they're going to dismiss Him altogether. But there are going to be people who respond. And according to Scripture, it seems that the Jewish nation will have two-thirds of their population wiped out, but the one-third that comes through will then, they will look to their Maker. They will see. The sorrow will help them to see their Maker. And this is a choice we're presented with in life we can either look to our maker and acknowledge that in the middle of difficulty, he is good and he is trustworthy and he is love. And in doing so, we rejoice not for all things, Thessalonians says, but we rejoice in all things. And so we are delivered supernaturally through that thing with peace that passes understanding and grace and dignity that we don't possess on our own. Or we choose to then just suffer through and endure, and we don't reap joy. We actually then, in this life, as a Christian, can be bitter. And Jude would say that we're saved as if by fire. We're smoking robes, folks. They, they pluck, we made it to heaven, but it's, who's, got, who's got the burnt mustache? Oh, that's that guy. You know, he's smoking robes. And, and so thank God for smoking robes, but it's not the way you want to go. Now, we've got one more verse. I know you guys are done, but I'm not. So verse 14, then behold, at eventide, trouble. So when God judges the earth, it's going to look like it's trouble. And in the morning, there's going to be no relief. We're all going to be wiped out. And before the morning, it says, he is no more. Who is no more? Trouble. Your enemy is no more. And this is the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who rob us. So the portion of those oppressing Israel would be in the morning. Uh, it would seem like we're not going to make it through the night, but we're going to be delivered. And in the great tribulation, Jesus is going to come back. And then there's going to be no more trouble immediately in, in a moment's time. Now, uh, this kind of alludes to what would happen in the southern kingdom of Judah uh, several years after this writing. So I got one more story for you. And it comes uh, from 2 Kings. And, and the reason I want to tell you this story is because verse 14 is important. If there's this whole chapter on harvesting sorrow, then I want you to understand that if you respond appropriately, the harvest of sorrow is never the final word concerning sorrow. It, it's not the final word. The harvest of sorrow is not the final word sorrow on the harvest of sorrow. So here's the, here's the situation. Um, go back with me. Assyria attacks and takes away Israel about 722 BC. 701 BC, the southern kingdom, Judah, has, uh, they survived. Their brothers up to the north, they knew they were wicked. They got carried away. They're like, we knew that was going to happen. They've been turned since the beginning. They never had one good king. They down in the south doing well. So they're like, we're doing way better. Have you ever done this? Like, I'm doing way better than that guy, which that's the wrong guy to be judging yourself against. As Christians, we don't judge ourselves. We don't judge other people. We judge the Lord, and he's found good, and then me compared to him, now I got it. <laughs> so they're, they're comparing themselves to their uh, nasty northern brother, and Assyria decides to come down on them. And uh, Syria with uh, not Tiglath Pileser at this point, but a guy named Sennacherib, and he is a bad motor scooter. Uh, Sennacherib, I put there for you, his name, he's named after the moon god Sin, who, by the way, is just the Babylonian uh, Nimrod. But all that said, if you're named after a god named Sin, you're probably not the greatest guy. And so he surrounds Jerusalem, 
and he besieges it, which is the way you did warfare in that day. You starve people out. And uh, then my favorite guy in the Old Testament shows up, um, a guy named the Rabshakeh. I want to be the anything, right? I want to be, but the Rabshakeh, isn't that the greatest name ever? The Rabshakeh, and he's paid to mouth. He's a paid mouther uh, by the Assyrians. They pay him to stand on a wall and like mouth all the people are looking out and he's mouthing in their language like you've trusted in your gods and here's all the gods that people trusted in and we took them down and then we daisy chained them together with fish hooks and took them off I and mean, he's mouthing this guy's unbelievable to the point that then he was like if he doesn't have people scared to death enough he writes a letter and the letter basically says in the morning you're dead meat and so i mean that's the mike harrison version so you can read it for yourself second kings 19 so what Hezekiah the king does, the king of uh, Judah, he takes the letter, he calls Isaiah. We're going to get to this in Isaiah. He calls Isaiah, and they spread the letter out before God, and they basically said, God, you're the only one that can change this situation. And then here's what it says. It happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of Assyria, and when the, that's the Judah, or the Jerusalem men, rose early in the morning, I like this, behold, all of them were dead. <laughs> I mean, that's how, isn't that funny how you can read That's how God deals with it. Behold, all of them were dead. 185,000, now that's like an understatement of the Old Testament. All of them were dead. And, uh, and so, I mean, very understated, so Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home. Game over. The Rabshakeh, no big deal. This is the God who we worship. This is the God of our salvation. This is the God who says, if you respond to me in the harvest of sorrow, sorrow is not the final word on your situation. And so finally, and now you can all close your Bibles, it's about over. The idea here is in the harvest of sorrow, we may forget God. I mean, the reason for the harvest of sorrow is that we forget God, but then in the harvest of sorrow... It's very easy to forget God, but here's the truth about the whole thing. If this thing were dependent on us forgetting or not forgetting, we're doomed to begin with. So the truth is about this. This is what the Old Testament story tells us. This is what the Bible tells us, that the, the harvest of sorrow is often cause for us to forget God, but God never forgets us. That's the key to the whole deal. I mean, that's the key to this whole story. And Isaiah 49 verse 14 says this, uh, and, and, and God says, you guys say, this is the Israelites, that the Lord has abandoned me. He's forgotten me. But God says, can a woman forget her own baby and not love the child she bore? And, and the answer is, notice he didn't say, can a man. A man can forget their child. I forgot my kid at church one time, made it home. Made it home, had one kid didn't have the other kid. My wife had a meeting with women. She called me, phone rang, said, this is what I heard, you forgot one. <laughs> so it's almost impossible for a woman to forget a child, but it does happen in rare circumstances. But, but what God's saying, if, if you think about how impossible it is for a loving mother to forget a child, he said, even if that could happen, I will never forget you. It's something to remember. No matter what you and I are going through, God never forgets us. He is not taken by surprise by anything in our life. And he is good. And he is true. And he is love. And what the amazing thing about the Bible is this. It says that in the Old Testament, all this stuff that we know was written on tablets of stone. And you had to apprehend it and do it because you needed to do it to live but in Jeremiah, God says, I'm going to take all that stuff that I wrote on stone tablets and by my spirit, I'm going to write it in my new covenant on the tablet of your heart. And then it's not a have to, it's a get to. And Charles Spurgeon said about this, oh, it's not my remembering God. It is God's remembering me, which is the ground of my safety. It is not my laying hold of his covenant, but his covenant laying hold of me. And so the beauty of the new covenant is I get to not forget God. In the old covenant, I should not forget God. In the new covenant, in every situation, I get to not forget God. I get to realize that in the middle of my bad situation, he is good. He is true. He is love. 
this sorrow isn't the final word on this situation and that he is the God of all eternity. Step back, take a look. He's past my vanishing point. He's faithful. He's true. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the God of our salvation. We thank you for Jesus who provides us said salvation. And so, Lord, we, you know, in the middle of prophecies of judgment, we thank you for truth and we thank you for grace. We thank you for mercy and we pray that you'd give us the faith to not forget you uh, in the good and in the bad, in the easy and in the tough. And we pray that you would uh, fashion us into your likeness and give us the, uh, the joy of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys stand?